can record on this computer. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see viable. Yes. Okay, all right. Variable. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another session, part two of statistics. Uh, yesterday, I think uh, I got a mixed bag uh, feedback. Uh, some people understood, some were more confused, uh, and some were struggling even with uh, a little more basic concept. So, today I've tried to put a couple of slides before I continue the presentation. I've just created a few more slides to give you some more clarity and then help you along. Now, the most important thing is please shut your microphone. Because otherwise, I will get disturbed. So I'm not familiar with this subject, so I have to concentrate, okay? It's not my home ground. Okay, so uh, one of the feedbacks which we got from all of you is that uh, people are struggling with uh, a little more basic concepts of statistics. Uh, so the parametric and non-parametric tests were a bit difficult for them to understand. So I have got, taken a step back and I've even started trying to explain to you what is a variable, okay? So we'll do a couple of slides about variable, we'll do a couple of slides about parametric and non-parametric tests, where to use it, and then we will carry on. Uh, somebody uh, take over as a host. Uh, who wants to take over? So Vikas, are you with us? Or is Shilpa with us? Hello? Yes. Uh, so you can you host. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, one person. I'm going to make you the host, Shilpa. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so whenever this microphone rings or whatever, just can you make sure they stop it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, just you take control of that because I need to mm. focus on the slides. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now you are the host of the show, so you can control everything. Okay, so as I said, uh, a lot of people are struggling even with some uh, more basic concepts. So let's first define what is a variable. So I, I just use some terms which I assume that people would know. So variables are, 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 are structures are, are fields in which the characteristics that differ, okay? So they are characteristics that differ from subject to subject, from time to time, and they're called as fields, okay? So data that you record into an Excel sheet, each, each cell of an Excel sheet is a variable, okay? It's as simple as that. So each cell of the Excel sheet is a variable. All right. So, hey guys, what is happening? Yeah, the, impossible. To mute, just mute everybody. Shilpa, just mute everybody. Do mute all. Okay. So each cell of an Excel sheet is called as a variable. So whenever I use the word variable, it means I am referring to a data point. Okay. So variables are characteristics that differ from subject to subject and time to time, okay? Uh, data that you record into an Excel sheet <clears throat> is of two types, okay? Whenever I use this word, you must understand. One is called as a numerical data, and the other one is called as a categorical data. Numerical data is made up of numbers, okay? So age, weight, number of child, children, shoe size, etc., etc. Categorical data is made up of uh, words. So eye color, gender, blood type, ethnicity, etc. Now numerical data can be two types again. It can be either continuous or it can be discrete. Okay. And when I say continuous, it means there are infinite options. It can go from zero to infinity. Okay, that is called as continuous data. So age, weight, blood pressure, this is all continuous data. It's numerical data, but it is infinite. As opposed to that, we have discrete data. Discrete data is something which has got only... No, for that, fight on. We will finish this. We have done it before and we will do it again. So any question there, I want to make for this public. Sandeep, iPad, please. I am muting them one by one, literally one by one. 
Just do mute all. At the bottom, there's something called as mute all. Just do it. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello? You can't yeah. hear me? Yes. yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. So data that we put into the fields is uh, two types. I'm just going to repeat this. Because this is the basis of all conversation. So statistics, when we talk, the language is different. So if you don't even know the language, if you don't know what I'm talking of when I say continuous data, then you're going to struggle with all the tests, okay? So data that is, is numerical and categorical. Numerical is made up of words. Categorical is made up of, uh, numerical is made up of numbers. Categorical is made up of words. And then numerical data is continuous, something that has infinite options. And discrete has finite options. Only a finite number of uh, cases can be put into that sample size. Uh, on the other side, categorical data is ordinal and nominal. Ordinal means it has got a hierarchy. So one is better than the other is better than the other. Okay, so from, from top to bottom, there is a clear cut hierarchy in that data. And nominal is it doesn't have a hierarchy. It can be anything random. So eye color, you know, brown, black, blue, green. There is no hierarchy. Not that brown is better than black or better than... So pain severity is mild, moderate, severe, okay? Hierarchy, one is lower than the other is lower than the other, okay? So it's a hierarchy, whereas here, nominal data is, there is no hierarchy. These are just words which make up each cell of an Excel sheet is a different, could be a different word. So that is the difference. So whenever we talk about all the tests that we do, remember these are the words which are gonna come to you continuous data discrete data ordinal data and nominal data is it it's very simple concept okay so now let's look at what is again what are the differences between parametric and non-parametric tests i think people were very confused yes so let me talk about non-parametric tests non-parametric tests can be used on ordinal and nominal scale data okay you know these two words now okay Parametric data is mainly used on interval and ratio scale data, okay? Non-parametric can be used on small samples. Parametric is used on larger samples. Most important, this is the most important, I told you yesterday, non-parametric is used on not normally distribute, distributed, which means skewed data. Parametric should fit a particular distribution. If it doesn't fit a particular distribution, your results will not be accurate. But there is a, a scheme within statistics where skewed distribution can be made in, to fit a normal distribution by using a log of the, of the value, okay? All right. This can be used where samples are not ra selected randomly. Okay, here the samples have been drawn randomly from a population, okay? So we have an order of the sample and they are randomly selected. But non-parametrics are, are not as good as parametrics. Parametric tests are more powerful than non-parametric. So when you get a p-value, provided you have applied the correct test, then the p-value has more power, more likelihood of being true than non-parametric. So non-parametric has less power, okay? So this is the basic difference between the two types. So again, I've repeated this just for your, uh, this thing. So you've got the t-test, which I told you, and then you've got the uh, one-way analysis, okay? The correlation, Pearson's correlation, we have not yet covered, so we haven't done correlation and regression. So leave these two away, the Pearson and Spearman. And on the non-parametric side, we spoke, there is Wilcoxon, there is Mann, Whitney, you, and Crookshall, Wallace, okay? And we also said Friedman's, okay? If you want to know uh, more types of parametric tests, then the Fisher's exact test I told you yesterday, which is used for small samples, okay? So this is the way you've got it all written out. So you don't really have to worry very much. Uh, the, the statistical guide will actually tell you uh, if you know what your data is, whether it's nominal, ordinal, whether it's discrete or it is normal, then you have got clear cut guidelines of which tests to use for which type of data, okay? So it's quite important. And again, we've got a big uh, outcome. So we've got a big chart and this chart uh, it, it tells you, you know, what is the input variable that you're working at? 
So whether it's nominal or whether it's ordinal, things like that. And on the other side, what is the output that you're looking for? And depending upon the two, it works out which test to do. Now, this is not something that you have to worry very much about. All you have to know is normal distribution, parametric, skewed distribution, non-parametric. It's very, very simple, okay? That's why I tried not to give you more information on these tests because it confuses you more than it helps you. So that's why it's not important to know the details of the test. All you need to know is what to do, where to do, and when to do. That's it, okay? So did this help a little bit? Is it clear, the concepts I just said? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Okay. So now let's continue the lecture where we left it, left yesterday, okay? So the we, we said that we have done uh, the first three parts. Now we've got four more parts to cover in statistics. So let's look at comparison risk. How do we compare risks between two groups, okay? So there are two tests, two or three tests which are available. One is risk ratio and the second is odds ratio. So I'll explain each one of this in detail. And this is very interesting and it will clarify all your doubts uh, as we go along. There is a concept called as risk reduction. There's a concept called as number needed to treat. And similarly, there's a concept called as numbers needed to harm. Okay. So risk ratio, odds ratio is what we have to focus on. So let's look at risk ratio. Okay. So what is risk? In statistical language, we are not talking about uh, general medical language. In statistical language, risk is the probability that an event will happen. Very simple. So that is what we mean when we say risk, okay? It is calculated by dividing the number of events by the number of people at risk, okay? So I'll, I'll get some figures out in a minute. So it's calculated by dividing the number of people, number of events, by the number of people at risk. Simple, okay, straightforward. So if one boy is born for every two births, okay, the probability or the risk of giving birth to a boy is one divided by two. So number of risks divided by total number of people that can be affected. So one divided by two. Okay, so not 0.5. Clear? Very straightforward. Okay, so if you go higher, then the number changes. So if one in every 100 patients suffers a side effect from a treatment, then the risk is 1 in 100, which is not 0 0.01. Okay, and I've given this higher number for a reason because I'm going to talk about odds ratio in a minute. Okay. So the risk ratio, what does it mean? The risk, it, it actually travels, it, it actually calculates the risk for an event happening when you do something. So it, it's simple words, is the risk of death while traveling to the shop to buy a lottery ticket is higher than the risk of winning the lottery ticket. So that is why it's important to calculate risk when we are talking in statistical terms because within the same event, there are two things that are happening. Okay, one is you're traveling and one is you're buying a lottery ticket. And until and unless you define the risk for traveling and define the risk of the lottery ticket, your statement in a statistical uh, method will not make any sense to the audience. That is why you have to use the risk ratio. So that's, this is how you make the statement. The risk of death while traveling to the shop to buy a lottery ticket can be higher than the risk of winning the lottery ticket. This is how the bottom line of your paper will state, okay? And so this is how you have to work risk ratio. When is it used? Uh, relative re risk is used in cohort studies and in prospective studies. I spoke about cohort and prospective in the last lecture. Uh, and they, they look, uh, they, they are used in cohort and prospective studies that follow a group or a cohort over a period of time and investigate the effect of a treatment or a risk factor. Okay, so you've got a group, you're giving a treatment, but you need to know whether the treat, what is the possibility of the treatment working or not working? What is the risk of a treatment of a patient getting better or not getting better? So that's how 
risk ratio is decided okay so these are calculated the ratio is calculated by dividing the risk in the treated or exposed group by the risk in the controlled or unexposed group so in the first instance you calculate the risk in the treated group so number of events divided by total number of the group will give you the risk then you go to the control group and you calculate the risk in the control group what is number of events divided by total number of in the group and then you do this number which comes out that risk divided by this risk gives you the risk ratio okay i'll show you an example so the risk of an event happening in one group divided by the risk of it happening in another group okay so if risk ratio is one that means it's the same whether in, in group a or group b then there is no difference in the risk between the two groups okay because a upon b both must be the same that is why they have cut each other and the answer was one if the risk ratio is more than one that means the top the treatment group has a higher chance of having that risk okay so the numerator is higher than the denominator and the denominator is always the control group okay so when the numerator which is the treatment group has got a higher risk than the denominator then the risk ratio will be more than one okay similarly if the numerator is less which is the treatment group than the control group then the risk ratio becomes less than one okay so the rate of that event is reduced this is how we write in the papers what is the value of risk ratio so zero or uh, one is no risk or no difference between a and b the risk is there but there's no difference between a and b more than one it is increased risk in treatment group as compared to the control group less than one the rate of the risk is less in the treatment group than the control okay so let's look at a few things always risk ratios are presented with their 95 percent confidence intervals what i'm saying here is we always give values which will tell you that we are 95 percent confident that if these values of the given study were applied to the general population this risk ratio will be true okay so if the other important thing you have to remember is this is a fact now i cannot change this if the confidence interval for a risk ratio does not include one does not include one it is statistically significant okay this is a fact of mathematics so just remember this so if a confidence interval for a risk ratio does not include one then it means it is statistically significant okay so just stay with me on that so again now i'll bring back two slides which i showed you in the last uh, lecture yesterday which everybody got confident uh, got uh, confused so a confidence interval usually is said to be good in relation to a risk ratio when it is small or it is tight when it is on the same side of unity so on one side of one is a good confidence interval if it is going beyond one if the confidence interval goes beyond one it's statistically not significant if it is less than one or same side of unity it is statistically significant and the third number that you have to remember is if it is less than not 0.85 it also becomes clinically significant okay so just these are facts you cannot change it don't ask me why this is a mathematical fact so if risk if confidence intervals does not touch unity it is statistically significant if it is beyond one it is not significant as i said that if it is on the same side of one it is statistically significant if it is below 0.85 it becomes clinically significant so i'm bringing back one slide from before which will now start to make sense 
This is the risk ratio for this group of patients. Uh, this was a cholesterol study which we looked at and we were looking at what was the risk of cholesterol causing uh, hyperlipidemia and hypertension in a group of patients as compared to a control group. So there are five studies which have looked at this and these are five different risk ratios which have been documented and they have also documented confidence intervals of these. So now you start to understand what I was saying the other day. So we said, if, oh, who's scratching? Don't, don't scratch on the screen, guys, please, okay? All right, so we said that if confidence interval touches beyond one, it is statistically not significant. So A, not significant, okay? If it is less than one or same side of unity, but not touching 0.85, it is statistically significant, but clinically not significant. If it is less than one, but touching 0.85, it may be, it is statistically significant, but may be clinically significant because it is touched 0.85. This one is touching one, so not statistically significant but maybe it's touching 0.85 so it may be clinically significant and this one is not touching one so it is statistically significant and it is not it is less than 0.85 so it is clinically significant so in one graph of a forest plot we have shown you everything all the data with five studies and given you almost a paragraph worth of description in a graphical representation so this is how you interpret data is the graph has to be represented so in the exam if i give you this graph and i will give you this graph that is what we do we give you this graph you have to look at the graph and you have to tell me everything that is here at the bottom all this that i said has to be said only by looking at this graph so this bottom half doesn't come. Only the graph is given to you and you're asked. So you're going to start with saying, this is a forest plot. This is what it is. This is a risk ratio. You can see here, it is said there's a risk ratio. There's a confidence interval defined for each of these studies. These seem to be five studies, which probably are part of a meta-analysis. The risk ratio has been defined on this with confidence intervals being defined. The first study is touching one, so it is statistically not significant. And it's not touching 0.85, so it's clinically not significant, and so on and so forth. And usually at the bottom, if it is a forest plot, then at the bottom you will have the diamond, which is a cumulative of all of these, okay? And so the cumulative diamond is the final answer of the meta-analysis on the basis of the five studies that have been put up on display. Okay, now please tell me whether you understood or did not understand. Understood. I, 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 understood, I, but need to practice. Understood, yeah. understood. Did you, oh, is yeah. it clear? This is how the graph will yes. be given to you. Yes, yes, clear. And you need to talk to me about the graph. And I spoke for five to seven minutes only on the basis of this one graph you understood that so this is important to say you must learn practice every time the only way to practice statistics is to take a graph and read out to me what is the interpretation of that graph so this is why i put this up here so you have to read out to yourself or to me what is the interpretation of this graph that i've put up here but until or unless you know what is confidence interval or what is risk ratio you cannot read out this graph okay all right makes sense so far it's very important what i just told you this is how the fects exam goes febts and frcs also i have been asked personally graphs in the frcs exam okay so be very very careful this is the way you have to practice so let's give you an example of a risk ratio again most of my slides are from that book medical statistics made easy so when you go back and revise, keep the book open and go through this and it's easily available. The PDFs are available on the internet if you want. So
So just sit with that and try to ex understand what I'm trying to say. So let's look at an example, okay? So you've got 1,000 football players and 1,000 non-footballers, okay? Now, we did a one-year follow-up of both the groups. 12 footballers had broken legs, had fractures. 12 footballers. Four in the non-footballers had fractured. So the question is, does football causes increases the risk of having a fracture leg? Okay, that's the question. So the risk in a footballer's group is 12 divided by 1,000, okay? 12 divided by 1,000, which is not 0.012. The risk of a non-footballer's group is 4 divided by 1,000, which is not 0.004. So what will happen is I'll give you just the first data, first four lines of the data, and I'll tell you what's the risk ratio of this group. Having football being uh, a fracture, uh, football being the cause of fracture. So this is how you calculate. First, you calculate risk of footballers, then you calculate the risk of group B, and then A over B. Okay, so not point not one two divided by not point not not four, which is three. And then I'll give you the confidence interval, and the confidence interval is not point nine seven to nine point four one. But most of it is way out beyond unity. And one of them is touching unity. Can you see that? It's not 0.97 will touch unity. It will cross unity. So not significant. Statistically, not significant. And this is so wide out that you need to investigate this further. You need to understand uh, you know, what is happening in this group. So it is not significant, but this confidence interval is too wide. And if it is so wide, then you need to know further. You need to do more tests in the group to define what is the difference between A and B. Did you understand this? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yeah. Don't question me on the numbers. The numbers have come out of the software. So why confidence interval came from 0.97 to 9.41 is not the question which I have to answer. That has come out of the numbers, okay? So that is what you have to do. The, the computer calculates those numbers and then you have to interpret those numbers. So that is risk ratio. Let's look at another concept called as odds, okay? So we've done risk. Now what are odds? Odds is the number of times it happens divided by the number of times it does not happen in a group of patients is different from risk. Risk was number of, uh, risk is number of risks divided by total people in the group. Whereas odd is number of times an event happens to the number of times it does not happen in a group of patients. I'll explain this more, stay with me. So odd and risks are, they are more or less similar when you are uh, considering rare events. So when it is a rare event, a smaller group, a smaller number, the odd and risk calculations will come out to be quite similar. But when the group size increases or when you get to more common events, then the odd and the risk separate out. The concept of odd and risk separates out. And so that is why it is important to understand both the, both the facts, okay? So winning the lottery is a rare event. Not winning the lottery is a common event. So the odd and risks of these will be substantially different. And you have to calculate that out. So let's look at the same example, okay? We said one boy is born for every two births. The risk of that group of one boy being born is one divided by two, which is not 0.5. But in this group, one boy is born and one girl is born. One event was the odd and one event was where the odd did not happen. So one boy was born and one boy was not born. So it is one divided by two, uh, one divided by one. Risk would be one divided by total group. 
whereas odd is 1 divided by 1 because one boy was born and more importantly one boy was not born so that is how odds are calculated so 1 over 1 is equal to 1 okay that's the difference so look here very again i put the two side by side for you to understand so odds is one event happening divided by one event not happening the same group so one over one whereas risk is one event happening over total number of events happening one over two okay so let's carry on so one in every hundred patients suffers a side effect from a treatment the odds are 1 over 99 because one had the side effect, but 99 did not. As opposed to this, if you were calculating a risk, it would be 1 over 100. You understood that? So this is how you calculate the odds and risk. So when it is, when is it used? It's used by epidemiologists when they are looking for factors which do harm and it is a way of comparing patients who already have a certain condition with patients who do not have the condition so it's like a case control study so within the group there is a there's a group which has the disease and the group which does not have the disease works as a control for that group for the first group okay so a case control study usually comes up with odds ratio. So the odd of an event happening in one group divided by the odd of it happening in another group. Okay, that's how you calculate. What do you mean by odds ratio of one? Odds ratio when it is one, it means there is no difference in event between the groups. The odds in each group are the same of an event happening. If the odds ratio is greater than one, the rate of the event is increased in patients who have been exposed to the risk factor. When odds ratio is less than one, the rate of that event is reduced. Okay. So less than one reduced, more than one increased, one no difference between A and B. So odd ratios are also given with their 95% confidence interval. So any odds ratio that is thrown at you, you have to give a 95% confidence interval so that your study can be applied to the general population, to the true population. So that you can become 95% confident that the answer that you have re received of the odds ratio can be applied to the general population. If the confidence intervals for an odds ratio does not, does not include one, it is statistically significant. Okay. This is important. This is a biological fact. So examples, 100 patients with knee injuries matched for age and sex versus 100 patients with no knee injuries in group one 40 people did skiing and 60 people did not so the odds is 40 over 60 not 40 over 100 but 40 over 60. the risk would be 40 over 100 but the odds are 40 over 60 which is not 0.66 in the control group, 20 patients skied and 80 did not. So the odds are 20 over 80. The risk would be calculated at 20 over 100. The odds are calculated at 20 over 80. So you got 0 0.25. The odds ratio is 0 0.66 divided by 0 0.25, which is 2.64. Okay, this is done by the computer. And then the 95% confidence interval came out to be 1.41 to 5.02, okay? Since this does not include one, it is statistically significant. 
the skiers are more likely to get a knee injury than non-skiers. That is the statement you make at the end of this analysis. This is how you will have to analyze. So we will give you the first three lines and say, give me the analysis. What is the odds ratio? And can you tell me if skiers in group one uh, are more like uh, skiers are more likely to get knee injury? Okay, that's how the question comes to you in the exam. Some authors will write the odds ratio as percentages. Okay, in their papers, you have to understand this that actually some people will change it into percentages. So odds ratio of 2.64, if you calculate it with percentage. It is written as 164% increase in the odds of knee injuries. Okay, so very important to understand when people present percentages in the paper rather than odds ratio. It's always better to look at the odds ratio themselves. Okay, so odds and risks, similar values when we consider rare events. I said this earlier, but maybe substantially different for common events and this is again i'm repeating this purely for your understanding in some case controls look for odds ratio rather than risk ratio odds ratio gives you a better understanding of what is happening in the group rather than risk ratio okay everybody okay it was clear or difficult yes sir yeah it's not an easy concept it confuses you, but I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. You will not understand straight away and it will not come in the lecture. You have to go back and make up your own mind about it. Okay. So let's look at the next concept. Okay. ARR, NNT, and RRR. Absolute risk ratio, relative risk ratio, number needed to treat. They are used when an author wants to know how often a treatment works rather than just whether it works okay so one answer is that giving paracetamol reduces fever but when you want to know in how many patients does or how much percentage can paracetamol reduce fever then you have to use these numbers okay arr absolute risk ratio numbers needed to treat and relative risk ratio. So let's understand that now. So risk reduction and numbers needed to treat are helpful in trying to work out how worthwhile a treatment is in clinical practice. Okay, please. This is the whole concept of doing all of these things. So these two things are important when you're trying to work out whether a treatment. So at this moment, the one paper you must read is just been published in New England Journal of Medicine. And the paper is whether hydroxychloroquine works in COVID patients, COVID-19 patients. So they have looked at risk reduction number needed to treat. So if you haven't read this paper, please go and read this paper. Just been published in New England, NEJM. Is hydroxy, does hydroxychloroquine reduce um, uh, reduce risks in COVID-19. Okay, so then you use this sort of an analysis. So what is absolute risk reduction? It's the proportion by which an intervention reduces the risk of an event. Okay, so the proportion by which an inter... So here you've got a number saying how much percentage will it reduce the risk when you do an intervention okay quite important to understand this concept the number needed to treat is the number of patients that need to be treated for one patient to get benefit okay so you may you know you the lesser the number to be treated to for one patient to get benefit the better the treatment is Okay, ideally, it should be 100%. That means every patient who gets the treatment gets benefit, gets benefited. Okay, so number needed to treat is a different concept. Absolute risk reduction means the difference between event rate in the intervention group 
and that in the control group okay that is the definition of absolute re reduction it's a difference of the event rate between a versus b again we are talking about numerical values here okay it is the reciprocal of nnt okay that's also another important concept and is usually given as a percentage so if you reduce the risk the number needed to treat will go down okay so it's it's important to understand this concept higher the arr lower the number needed to treat yeah so that's why it's a reciprocal of number needed to treat so arr is usually calculated as 100 divided by nnt absolute risk re reduction is calculated as 100 divided by number needed to treat let's look at relative risk reduction the proportion by which an intervention reduces the risk of an event so let's look at this okay this is the example now you will start to understand what we are talking about so 100 women with vaginal candida were given oral antifungal 100 were given placebo and they were reviewed three days later okay this is the results these are facts these are all data that you've just filled in so absolute risk reduction is improvement rate in the intervention group this is the intervention group this is not an intervention group so absolute risk reduction is improvement rate in the intervention group minus the improvement rate in the control group so 80 minus 20 okay is uh, is the 20 percent uh, 80 minus 60 so 80 minus 60 which is 20 percent okay nnt numbers needed to treat we said arr is 100 over nnt so nnt is 100 over ar arr so 100 divided by 20 which is 5. so the statement that you make out of this graph which will be given to you you will just get this paper and you will be asked to tell us what do you interpret from this graph the statement is five women have to be treated for one to get benefit you understand that's how statements are made in clinical papers whenever you do your statistics the the discussion part or the conclusion is based on statistics and the conclusion has to come out of statistics so if only if you have done this calculation will you be able to make this statement that five women have to be treated for one woman to get benefit did you understand this concept yes or no yes yes sir. understood yeah is it getting confusing or is it okay so far it is okay you will you will not grasp everything straight away just stay with me you have to keep going back and looking at it and then it will click in your brain somewhere it will click all i'm trying to do is i'm trying to just light spark i'm going to give you the spark and you have to catch the fire okay i cannot you clarify in your brain straight away okay yeah sorry once again sir once again uh go back and read it uh, this is being recorded so don't try to remember it now go back and listen to the lecture again okay all right let's okay. look at relative risk reduction so the same group same data now the incidence of candidiasis was reduced from 40% in the placebo group to 20% with treatment. You agree with that? So it was reduced 40 over 20 by half. So the relative risk reduction is 50%. 40 over 20, so 50%, right? That's how you calculate relative risk reduction. Okay, all right. So lower the number needed to treat better. I said this before. You need a lesser number to be needed to be treated for a treatment to become better, to be acceptable. But look at the context. Always it is not true. You have to look at the context of it. Okay. So if number needed to treat is 10 for treating a sore throat with a very expensive antibiotic, 
then that is not attractive. But if it is 10 for prevention of death from leukemia, then that is a worthwhile. So number needed to treat depends on the context in which you are talking. What is the treatment that you're going to use? So though 10 may be a low number, but using a very expensive antibiotic is not good enough. Whereas if you can manage to save life, then it is worthwhile. So always, whenever you read a paper and you look at number needed to treat, look at the context in which the NNT has been stated. Okay. The same concept of NNT is also extended to a concept of number needed to harm, NNH. Okay. NNH, similar concept. So NNH is the number of patients that need to be treated for one patient to be harmed by the treatment. So it is a similar concept, except that instead of treatment, we are talking about patients being harmed. So some papers may actually talk about NNH. That is why I've thrown it into the mix so that you don't get thrown off when you see NNH instead of NNT, okay? All right, simple. Odds ratio, risks ratio. Numbers needed to treat, absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction. Five concepts which you need to understand. Even if you don't understand now, it's okay. It's absolutely fine. You need to go back and listen to my lecture and sit with your book and it will suddenly start to make sense. Okay? All right. Let's move on to the next. So out of the seven, we covered four now. We've got three left to go. What about statistics that analyze relationship, okay? So there are two types of statistics that analyze relationship. One is correlation and one is regression. How is A affected by B, okay? So let's look at that. What do you mean by that? When there is a linear relation between two variables, just a simple example, if blood sugar goes up, HbA1c goes up. There's a linear relation, okay, between variable one and variable two. So that's the easiest one to understand. So there is, whenever there's a linear relation between two variables, there is said to be a correlation between them. Okay, so if one goes down, the second goes down. If one goes up, the second goes up. So things like height and weight in children are classical examples where you use the concept of correlation. Socioeconomic class and mortality. Lower the socioeconomic class, higher the mortality. This has a reverse uh, correlation. The correlation doesn't have to be in the same direction. It can be in the opposite direction. So higher the socioeconomic class, lower the mortality. High, lower the socioeconomic class, higher. So correlation can be both the directions. It can be in a positive way where one goes up, the other goes up, or it can be reverse where one goes up and the other goes down, okay? So a strength of correlation between the two, how closely they are correlated is called as a correlation coefficient, okay? So that's, that's just a concept that you have to remember. So a coefficient, uh, coefficient, correlation coefficient is usually denoted as R, small r, okay? So the paper will say R equals 0.8 and you have to in interpret what does 0.8 mean, okay? So I'll talk about it in a minute. We'll go ahead and carry on and then we'll understand what an R is. So positive correlation means when one goes up, the other goes up. Blood sugar goes up, hepatitis A, HbA1c goes up. Positive correlation. Line on the graph, will slope from left to right. If you draw a vertical axis and a horizontal axis, blood sugar on one axis and uh, HbA1c on the other axis, the line will start from left to right and go up, okay? So the graph slopes up. Negative correlation, when one goes up, the other is down. Again, you draw an x-axis and a y-axis, so when X is less, Y is very high, okay? So the graph slopes down, left to right. So there's a difference in the two graphs. One comes going up 
from left to right and the other one comes from top to bottom so a reverse graph okay and i'll show you examples okay now the correlation is very important okay so the correlation coefficient is quite important what is the you know a versus b what is the correlation so if r is more than 1 in the paper whenever you are reading a paper and the correlation coefficient is more than 1 it tells you that this is a positive correlation in this situation the graph will go up from left to right because x axis is low y axis is low as x axis increases the y axis increases okay so that is a positive so r equals 1 is a positive correlation r equals minus 1 is a negative correlation whenever the paper talks about minus 1 r equals minus 1 this is the interpretation that should come in your mind that they are talking about a negative correlation and when r is equal to 0 between the two there is no correlation effect one does not affect the other a flat line it doesn't make there is no correlation it will be randomly scattered on the graph okay we'll come to the graph in a minute okay so r from 0 to 0.2 is a very low and probably meaningless r 0.2 to 0.4 is a low correlation so further away you go from 0 the correlation increases okay so if it is not 0.4 to not 0.6 it's a reasonable correlation if it is not 0.6 to not 0.8 it's a high correlation and if it is not 0.8 to 1 it's a very high correlation but the very high correlations are usually a warning so it is too high check for errors okay there could be other reasons your test may not be right the same thing will work on the negative side okay so if you go minus then the same thing works so its correlation can be positive can be negative so important to understand a low correlation a reasonable correlation and a high correlation anytime it goes towards one uh, something is not right it it is it is statistically not possible it it is possible but your your warning sign should come up whenever you read a paper where r is reaching one okay all right so see this is the paper this is what i was talking about blood glucose versus hba1c on the x axis is blood glucose on the y axis is hba1c so today my blood glucose was 5 and hba1c was 6 but last night my blood glucose was 24 and hba1c was 14 so this is a positive correlation going up as blood glucose goes up hba1c goes up okay so when you did the calculation in the statistical package you got an r of 0.88 so you will be thrown this graph and at the bottom it will say r is equal to 0.88 and you have to talk then you have to say this is a correlation graph okay this is a correlation package where and it is a positive correlation package and because r is equal to 0.88 it shows a very high correlation so either this is factually correct or there is some error in the in the statistics i need to look at the statistics again you understand that i'm not saying that r equals to not uh, r equals to 1 never exists it does exist but the higher the correlation more you have to be wary that something is wrong okay did this graph make sense it's called as a scatter plot. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, very important to understand this concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you have understood correlations. It will become very easy to understand regression. Okay. So let's go ahead. This is no correlation. R is minus 0.34. So it indicates it's a negative correlation. That means r in a increases b goes down but it's not a strong it's a low correlation it's not 0.34 you understand that and so stronger the correlation more tight will be the plot stronger the correlation more tightly more closely placed together will be the scatter plot lesser the correlation more randomly placed will be the scatter plot okay 
So it's body mass index versus activities. Excellent example of a negative correlation. All right, so whenever you see a graph, we just scatter thing like this. You have to start off saying, sir, this is a scatter plot for body mass index versus activity measure. Uh, this is a correlation study. Uh, the correlation coefficient is minus 0.34, which suggests that this is a negative correlation. And the value suggests that there is a low correlation coefficient between body mass index and activity measure. This is what you have to say. Okay. All right. Good. Understood. Good. Yes. So it can tell how strong is the relationship. Exactly. But, but the problem is it does not tell the cause and the effect. Why A or, or what amount of change in A brings about the change in B. That does not, is not told by a correlation thing. It only tells you that A changes, B changes. But it doesn't tell you what is the exact amount of change in A to bring about a change in B. So that's where you have to look at some other tests. I'll show you. Now, Pearson correlation is a method of calculating a correlation coefficient. Okay. But this works only when it is sampled from a normal population. So Pearson's coefficient, correlation coefficient is a parametric test. Did you understand that? This is how you work it. So it's a correlation, it's a method of calculating a correlation coefficient, but values have to be within a normal population, okay? Spearman's correlation coefficient is an estimation of coefficient for non-parametric variables. So Spearman is a non-parametric test, okay? And don't worry about the details of the test, just know the fact where Pearson's is used, where Spearman is used. The bottom line out of all of this is you will get an R value, a small R. And you have to learn to interpret what is that small R? What does a study mean when it's talking about a small R? So small R means that there is a linear relationship between two variables, okay? So where there is a linear relationship between the two variables, there is set to be a correlation between them, okay? And the correlation coefficient gives the strength of that relationship, okay? Whether it's positive or negative. Some papers square the R. They make it R square, okay? And when they use R square, it is always positive because minus into minus is positive, okay? So they don't want to give you the thing. So it's very difficult when some papers has used R square, it's very difficult to know whether the graph slopes up or down because everything is positive in an R square. It does say that variation in one causes change in the other. That's all, that's all you can do. The closer the value of R square to one, higher is the correlation. Okay, that's the R square, that's how you work out. So some, some statistics do not like the minus sign, so they square the value of R, and then it becomes R square, okay? So if R square is there, then you have to just understand that there is a correlation. Closer the R square to one, higher is the correlation. Okay. Look at this scatter plot. Same scatter plot, fasting blood sugar, HbA1c. R was not 0.88 because you were not sure what it is. So they've R squared it. So R squared is not 0.77. So R square is minus 0.88 into minus 0.88, so 0.77, okay? This means that 77% of the variation in HbA1c is related to the variation in fasting blood glucose. This is how you interpret the data out to me, okay? 77% of variation in HbA1c is related to the variation in fasting glucose, okay? All right. So we have understood correlation or at least got familiar with the concept of correlation. So we go to regression, that's the next one, okay? In regression, it's an analysis used to find how, the key is on how, how one set of data relates to the other, okay? 
So it is particularly helpful when we want to use another one measure as a proxy for another measure. Now stay with me on this one, okay? So if a patient has had a test, has a bedside test versus a lab test, okay, and the numbers that you get, if you want to correlate the two numbers, the regression is used as an example. And I, I know you're confused, but stay with me on this one. So regression analysis is a technique for finding the relationship between two variables. Each of one is dependent on the other. So if one changes, the second changes. But we need to know how much is the percentage change in one to cause a percentage change in the other. That is where you use regression. Regression is more specific than uh, correlation, okay? So in a regression, same patients categorize fasting blood glucose on the x-axis, HbA1c on the y-axis. The regression line draws a line across the scatter plot, okay? So it draws a regression line across the scatter plot. The moment you have a regression line, then anywhere on this graph, if it was a scatter plot, you cannot say what is the change in x to know what is the change in y. But the moment you have a regression line in the scatter plot, it becomes numeric. And you can then say at 15, what is the HbA1c? So 10. You understand that? So this is the difference between coefficient and regression. Regression is specific. At 8, I can say what is going to be HbA1c. At 12, I can use the regression line to tell me what is going to be HbA1c. The scatter, if it was a correlation thing, I could not make a guess onto what would, the numbers that are not there in the graph, I will not be able to make a guess what is the thing, unless and until I draw the regression line. The regression line is very important, and that is a different technique, okay? And that's a linear regression. So fasting blood glucose of 15 can predict an HbA1c of 9.95. So you can actually use regression to predict what could be the value of the other factor, okay? So the slope and the position of the regression line can be represented by the regression equation. Okay, this is mathematics. And this is how the equation is worked out. HbA1c is equal to 3.2 plus 0.45 into blood glucose. This is a mathematic calculation that is specific for every scatter graph. This 0.45 is called as the regression coefficient. The slope of the graph, okay, how much degree slope is it? That is called as a regression coefficient and that changes from um, study to study. So this calculation, they don't get hooked onto the numbers, get hooked onto the concept how a regression line can help you predict what will y be if x is so and so. Did you understand this? Hello? No? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. some of you have understood good. Even if you don't understand it, go back and listen to my lecture. It will make sense if you're sitting with your textbook, okay? So what's the difference of correlation versus regression? Okay, Co correlation measures the strength of the association between the variables, but regression quantifies that strength. Okay, it quantifies, it gives you the exact value, how much change in X will give you a change in Y. It quantifies that association, okay? And it should be, it should only be used if one variable is thought to precede or one variable is thought to cause the other. So there has to be a causal relationship between A and B before you can use regression values, okay? So it's quite important that you must know that A causes B. So the correlation will tell you that there is an association between A versus B, and then the regression will tell you how much is the association of A versus B, okay, between two groups. Now there are further techniques that are used in linear regression, and I'll just mention them. You, you just need to know that these are techniques of, uh, of measuring uh, 
the quantification of uh, association okay so logistic regression is a variation of linear regression usually used when there are only two possible outcomes okay so when either the patient can have disease or not have a disease so whenever in a study there are only two outcomes available you use what a technique called as logistic regression okay poisson's regression is the frequency of rare events so when you are talking with the rare events fewer events you use poisson's regression classical example is using waiting times poisson is used a lot when you are analyzing waiting times for surgery okay all right the more important one is the cox regression model okay this is something that you must understand cox regression model it is the effect of different variables on survival cox regression is a regression model but it is used in survival curves and when we talk about survival we'll talk about this okay so the same technique but used in survival all right so poisson is usually used for waiting times uh, logistic is used when there are only two outcomes a or b it's very specific if there are uh, okay so let's get on to the next one so we have done coefficient and we have done regression okay we did ratios and now we come to the second last one which is analyzing survival how do you analyze survival so there are various techniques available one is survival analysis one is life tables one is kaplan meier plots and cox regression i just told you about that the cox regression okay so when are these used these are used when the time until a single event occurs and that event is death this could be any other single event for example time until discharge okay so it's a technique that is used to define the time until a single event occurs which means you are trying to predict the future you are using the present data to predict the future all right and that is called as survival analysis so situations in which the end event has not happened in every patient has not happened is the future when information on a case is known for a limited duration so at this moment you know a little bit about the patient but you are trying to predict a situation in future that is when you use survival uh, analysis and censored observation means we have got limited of the duration observation so a small period of time you observe the patient a lung cancer guy came to your clinic he got operated you followed him up for 6 years okay sorry you followed him up for 3 years or 4 years okay but you are trying to give him 5 year survival you are trying to give him 10 year survival you are trying to give him 20 year survival so the censored obje- observation is because you only got 3 years so there was a sensor to the amount of data that was available to you but using that data you predicted the future and that is what is called as survival analysis did you understand this concept yes sir. okay all right so two things life tables and kaplan meier plots okay so life table is a table of proportion of patients surviving over time so look at the data it looks at the data at a number of fixed points and calculates the survival rates at those points okay and the commonest one of life table uh, the outcome is kaplan meier so let's look at kaplan meier this is very interesting to understand how a kaplan meier is plotted so it recalculates the survival rate when an end event occurs in a data set okay and i'll show you the graph and you will understand what i mean by this statement that an, it's a dynamic graph and every time in your group of patients of 100 lung cancers that you operated when one dies that gets plotted onto a survival curve and it changes the survival uh, the survival curve so it is a dynamic a uh, graph which each event when it happens recalculates the curve okay so rather than happening at fixed intervals it can happen and people can die any time so whenever they die the kaplan meier plot dips and there's a change in the curve okay so look at this so when you've got this curve 
every single little dip on this, this, this little dip is a patient has died. Do you understand that? So this is what it means. So every event that happens, so there is no fixed interval because here, uh, here patients died sooner. Here patients died after a longer time. So every single event that happens changes the curve. So every one of this zigzag. So you can never draw a Kaplan-Meier straight. You can never. Kaplan-Meier has always got to have this zigzag quality about it. And then the cumulative effect of the zigzag gives you the curve. So every single dip here is a patient has died. Okay, every single dip. Can you see that? And that's how you calculate the Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve for somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. Survival over years versus cumulative survival. Okay, so they've gone here, starts with 100% and always dips down like this with every death that is happening, it is changing. Okay, all right. Uh, so how do you interpret this is that at 20 years, 36% of these groups will be available. 36% of this group of patients was still alive. So Kaplan Mar gives you prediction in future, okay? So you, you can use the curve to predict what will be the outcome for this patient. Okay. It's also used to compare survivals between groups. It's a very, very good tool to compare A versus B in terms of survival. Excellent, the plot gives you a very clear pictorial representation of what is happening beautifully. So look at this, the same study, but now the a subgroup analysis has been done. The men have been differentiated from the women. And very clearly, the moment you look at the kaplan Mar graph, you can now clearly say that at 20 years, 46% uh, uh, of the patients of women are alive but only 20% of women, of men are alive, okay? So compliant markers can be used to compare treatments. So you can use it to compare surgery versus chemotherapy versus radiotherapy in uh, treatment of lung cancer. So you will have three graphs. And if all of them come close to each other, then all three treatments are equally good. If there is divergence of the graph, then the one on the top is a better treatment because you have more survival than the one at the bottom. More people are dying with the one which is at the bottom. So it's very important. The Kaplan Myers graph allows you to differentiate between various treatment modalities or allows you to differentiate between different groups of patients having the same disease. Okay. Did that make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. this is a very important concept. Kaplan Meyer will be shown to you in the exam, and you need to tell us why it is zigzag. So, mm -hmm. and, and you need to tell us how will you predict one versus another on the basis of the graph, okay? So that's what we need you to do. So now don't worry about the names of the other tests. Log rank test is a test to compare the survivals between the two groups. Uh, it's, it's just a technique and it, you look at p-value and p-value will tell you how significant the test is, okay? This is just a, on the computer, you can use two groups and you can uh, put them through log rank and you'll get a p-value and if the p-value is significant, then A is better than B or B is better than A depending on whatever comes out, okay? A Cox regression model, this is quite important. Cox regression model is used to investigate the relationship between an event, usually we're talking about that, to explain to possible explanatory variables, for instance, smoking status versus or weight. So let me just get more clarity on this. It provides us with the estimate of the effect. Okay, it provides us with the estimate. So remember uh, in the regression model versus coefficient model, coefficient only showed you a causes B, but regression showed you how much of A causes an effect in B. So that is what Cox does to survival curves. So when you apply a regression principle to a survival curve, then you get what is called as a Cox regression model. It provides us with an estimate of the effect 
that different factors have on the time until the end event. So, you know, does smoking cause uh, cancer? Uh, does uh, eating uh, uh, tobacco cause cancer? Does uh, chewing tobacco? Cause... So all of these factors can be used in the same curve and you can analyze it to give you a Cox regression model, okay? So as well as considering the significance of the effect of the different factors, that is how much shorter male life expectancy is compared to that of the women, the model can also give us an estimate of life expectancy survival of an individual. So you can actually use a coefficient, a regression coefficient to understand how much A will be at point B. So it's a future model, okay? The technique used is called as proportional hazard survival model. Okay, just just take it. Don't don't ask too many questions. It's it's a technique on the computer where they use a hazard survival model, and what the result that comes out of it is called as hazard ratio. Okay, so the end result that comes out of the computer is something called as hazard ratio. Okay, and it's a Cox regression technique that is used. So what is hazard ratio? Hazard ratio is the chance, the hazard, something harmful happening of an event in one group of observations divided by the hazard of events in another group, similar like odds ratio, okay? <clears throat> so the hazard of something harmful happening of an event in one group divided by the hazard of the same event happening in another group. So hazard ratio of one, when the when the uh, Cox regression model using proportional hazard ratio gives you a HR of one, it means that the risk is the same, okay? The risk is one X of group A as compared to group B. The risk is the same. If the hazard ratio comes two, then it is twice the risk, okay? So in one group of patients smoking, so in males, smoking may cause twice the incidence of lung cancer, as compared to females. That is how you interpret hazard ratio. So if HR is two for a group of patients with males and females looking at smoking as a risk of lung cancer, then this is the interpretation that you have to make. Okay. Look at this, how Cox regression has been done, okay? So this was the same graph I showed you earlier, men and women with the rheumatoid arthritis. This was the statement we made that at 46, at 20 years, 46% of females and 18% of men. Okay, now we apply the Cox regression to this graph. So when you apply the Cox regression to this graph, the, the answer comes back as hazard ratio of 1.91. Okay, and a p-value of 0.05. This is the computer result which will come back after you've done the test. The proportional hazard test has been done. The Cox model has been applied. So how do you interpret this model? And this is for males, okay? So the interpretation is a hazard ratio of 1.91 means that the risk of death in any particular time period for men was 1.91 times that for women. Did you understand this? So when I give you this, this, the right hand side, I want you to read the left hand side to me. I want you to be able to tell me the interpretation of the graph, okay? And then because p-value is less than 0.05, one more line you can add is this is statistically significant, okay? All right, okay. So there we are, uh, the same thing that I've explained, uh, 1.91. So this is also given a confidence interval, okay? So uh, confidence interval that they have given is 1.21 to 3.01. So we are 95% confidence that in the general population, we're talking about the general, now you're applying the data that you have from your study to the general population. And you are saying, I am 95% confident that the true hazard ratio for the general population lies between 1.21 and 
So you have to make that statement as well when I give you this chart in front of you. And then the p-value you have to say is statistically significant. Okay. So when this gets thrown at you, this is what is the answer which has to come out. The thing in blue is what I want you to say when white is given to you. Okay. All right. Degree of freedom is the statistical method for statisticians. Uh, they use uh, is the numbers of independent pieces of information that were available for the statistician to make the calculations. Uh, you don't need to know too much about it. Just know that whenever a result comes in, there's always a degree of freedom by how much the statistician used, how many data points the statistician used to calculate these numbers. Okay, so it gives you uh, details of what happening with the statistical end. Okay. Now the last one, which is quite important, is to analyze clinical investigations and screening. How do you do that? So when you're analyzing clinical investigations and screening, you're looking at sensitivity, specificity, predictive value, and level of agreement and kappa. Okay, so let's look at each one. So think of any screening test for a disease. The disease itself may be present or absent. Okay. The result test may be positive or negative. And screening these techniques will actually give you answers to these questions. Okay? So you have to use a screening test and you have to tell whether the disease is present or absent. And the test has to be positive or negative for the disease. And it's the correlation between the two is what we talk about when we talk about significance. Okay? So look at this one. All right. It's a very easy to understand, beautifully placed out. So test result on one side is positive, negative. The disease on the other side is present or absent. Okay. You got A, B, C, D. Okay. Forget the false, negative, false. Value. Just stay with A, B, C, D. Okay. So sensitivity. If a patient has the disease, needs to know how often the test will be positive. Positive in disease, true positive in disease. Okay, so whenever you have sensitivity, I usually look at the end. So for me, sensitivity tells me how many positives are there in the disease. It's the opposite. So for me, a sensitivity of the test is the ability of the test to correctly detect the presence of disease, the positivity in the disease. So N tells you positive, opposite, always the opposite. That's how you remember. Whenever we talk sensitivity of a test, it tells you how many positive cases will you find out using this test. So the way you calculate according to that table is, let's go back to the table. A divided by A plus C. A divided by A plus C is the way you calculate sensitivity, okay? So it is the rate of pickup of a disease in a test. You will be given a table and you will be asked to calculate sensitivity of a test. What is specificity? Look at P, easy way to remember. So the moment you get P, it talks of N, negative. So it talks of patients in whom there is no disease, okay, L lack of disease. So if, in, if the patient is in fact healthy, how often the test will be negative? Negative is the key thing in this. So P, negative. N, positive. Do you understand? That's an easy way to remember. So whenever you talk of sensitivity, you're trying to pick up how many patients are positive. When you're talking about specificity, you're trying to pick up how often the test will be negative. It's the opposite of P. So negative in health, and that is positive in disease. So sensitivity, positive in disease. Specificity, negative in health. So easy way is look at the P, look at the N, and that gives you the answer as to what the test is, okay? And the way you calculate according to the table is D, divided by D plus B, okay? And I should have put the table here for you to see it. The rate at a test, the rate at which a test can 
exclude the possibility of a disease. Okay, negative in health always. Specificity P, negative in health. Okay, that's the key thing. What is positive predictive value? If the test result is positive, what is the likelihood that the patient will have the condition? Okay. In this, the calculation is A divided by A plus B. Okay, I'll bring the table back up again. I think you need to look at that. So A divided by A plus B is a positive predictive value. The negative predictive value will be C, D divided by C, D plus C. So the number of times the test is negative, what is the likelihood that the patient will be healthy, okay? So D divided by D plus C. So what is the interpretation? If the test is perfect, then sensitivity, specificity, everything will be one. A perfect test. The lower the value of the test, less reliable is the test. Okay, so look at this. Same patient, same graph that I had before, but now we've put numbers into it. So sensitivity, we said is A, divided by a plus c yeah so 20 divided by 25 not 0.8 okay a divided by a plus c yeah so if gastric cancer is present there is an 80 percent chance or not 0.8 percent chance of the test picking it up that's how you tell me by looking at this graph uh, by looking at this table this is how you talk to me that in this table, the, if gastric cancer is present, the sensitivity of this test suggests that there is an 80% chance of the test picking up the disease. The same thing is looking at lack of disease. So D divided by D plus B. So 45 divided by 30 plus 45, which is not 0.6. So sensitivity is, uh, specificity if the gastric cancer is not there there is a 60 percent chance of the test being negative okay specificity if gastric cancer is not there there is a 60 percent chance of test being negative negative in health okay very important a uh, negative in disease and positive in health okay very important to understand so this is called as 40% will have false positive. If 60 are truly being detected as negative, the outcome of that is 40 are falsely being detected as negative. So they are false positives. Okay, you've missed 40 cases of uh, lung cancer. Okay, did you understand that? Yes, sir. Hello, yes or no? Yes, is it, yes sir. Yes, sir. Is yes, it more sir. confusing or less confusing? Uh, that moment we understand. We understand. Next slide, we forget. Okay. I don't know how to deal with that problem. <laughs> okay. So we'll but go again and it again. Needs yeah, it, it needs revision. Yeah. We, we require revision, sir. As yes. long as you understand the slide when I present it, that's all I want to do. Yeah. I cannot expect you to remember it the next time. It's too much data coming together, but. My job today is just to put it out there for you to go back and revise, okay? Problem is, even when you read the simple textbook of uh, medical statistics, uh, it, it's, it confuses you when you read a lot of the data together. So it's important, each slide has to be taken separately. Okay, positive predictive value. How do you calculate positive predictive value? A divided by A plus B, this one, this the positive one, A divided by, a plus B is not 0.4. So the positive predictive value is there is a 40% chance if the test is positive, the patient actually has gastric cancer. Okay. And we come into the negative predictive value, the second line, D divided by D plus C, 45 divided by 45 plus 5 is not 0.9. So there is a 90% chance if the test is negative that the patient does not have gastric cancer okay higher the number better is the quality of the test lower the number less reliable is the test okay all right
but there's still a 10% chance of false negative. That's what you have to remember also. That 0.9 means 0.1% you're missing. Okay. All right. All right. Let's look at the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio that the test result would be expected in a patient with the condition compared to the likelihood that the same result would be expected in a patient without the condition. So this is how you do it. You calculate the sensitivity and then you do sensitivity divided one minus specificity. So in our example, 0.8 divided by one minus 0.6, the likelihood is two. So when you have likelihood ratio of two, this is the answer. The test is positive in a patient. Patient is twice as likely to have gastric cancer than not to have it. So it tells you that it's a very, very sensitive test. It's a good test to tell you uh, whether the patient's got gastric cancer or not, okay? So let me just go through it again once, last time. This is the cumulative slide of all of them. It's it's very confusing topic, but let's get it. Sensitivity, N, how often the test is positive? N, P. So sensitivity is how often the test is positive if the patient has disease. Specificity, P, how often the patient is healthy? If, if the patient is healthy, how often the test will be negative? Okay, so negative and positive, N and P, opposites, opposites, okay? So this is the way to remember. Positive pre predictive value, if the test is positive, the likelihood that the patient has the condition. Negative predictive value, if the test is negative, the likelihood that the patient will be healthy. So higher the uh, higher the number, better is the correlation. And likelihood ratio, if the test is positive, how much likely that the patient is to have the disease than not to have it. Take a snapshot of this or go back to this slide. This is the main slide. This is what will eventually tell you the answer to specificity, sensitivity, PPV, NNV, and LR, okay? All right. Last concept, level of agreement and kappa, a comparison of how well people or tests agree and is used when data can be put into an ordered category. Used to look at how accurately a test can be repeated. For example, you did a test and you did it at Medanta and you also want to send it to Quest. Then you want to know what is the level of agreement between the results in Medanta and in Quest, okay? So you will use statistics to give you that level of agreement. Kappa is the value that you use. So kappa can be zero to one. If the kappa is zero, there is no significant agreement. If no, no more uh, than would have been expected by chance. So if kappa is zero, there is no agreement, okay, between the two tests. Uh, if kappa is 0 0.5 or more, it's considered a good agreement. A value of 0 0.7 shows a very good agreement and kappa of one is perfect agreement. That means, Medanta and Quest both gave same results. So Kappa was one, okay? A perfect agreement between a histology sample sent to Medanta lab versus sent to Quest. So in the, in the paper, it will say the Kappa was one between the two labs. That means both the test answers came back exactly the same. Both said this was thymoma B, okay? So that's how, that's called as Kappa. Kappa one is very good agreement between the two tests. So if the same cervical smear slides are examined by cytology department of two hospitals, K.03 is little agreement between the two laboratories, okay? K.1 is perfect agreement between the two laboratories. So let me just go, this is all right. Ordinal data is what you use. And this is when it's continuous. Forget this, this is too confusing for you guys. Okay, let's look at this one. Prevalence and point prevalence rate. Prevalence rate is important. You will be asked uh, uh, in the US MLE, you're asked this. The existing number of cases of a condition at a single point in time as percentage of the population. So how many cases are there today? The number of cases of COVID today, it got time factor in uh, the, in 30% of the population or in London population of 2 million, which is 30% of uh, UK population, okay? So it's a prevalence of a disease at one particular point as a percentage of the overall population. So at the time of the study, 90 people in a practice of 1,000 patients were suffering 
from Brecht's palsy. Okay, just an example, a vague example. 15 were diagnosed in last year. 75 were diagnosed in previous years. Okay. So the point prevalence, the prevalence rate is 90 divided by 1000, which is 90 divided by 1000, but because you want to put a percentage, you have to multiply it by 100. So the prevalence rate is not 0.9, okay? Not 0.9. Now, if it is a chronic disease, then the prevalence rate is always higher because every year you get new, dis new diseases which get add added to the prevalence rate. If it's an acute disease or short-term illness, the prevalence rate is usually lower than the incidence rate, okay? So it's quite important to understand this. All right. I'm sorry, it is very exhaustive, but it is the truth and that's what it is. Uh, let's do sample size calculation. This is the last concept that I needed to cover in statistics. This is quite important. Again, everything that I'm saying quite important is something that can be asked in the exam. This is frequently asked in the exam. I, I ask this very often to candidates. How did you calculate the sample size for your study? If they tell me they've done a thesis, then I ask them, how did you calculate the sample size for your thesis? Straightforward question. And you'll be surprised, nine out of 10 don't know. Nine out of 10 don't know the three factors they have to tell me. Okay, so I'll tell you what it is. The first thing is you have to talk about power of a study, okay? So the power of a study is the probability that it would detect a statistical significant difference, okay? So power of a study is important. If the difference expected is 100% cure with 0% cure with previous treatments, then a very small study is needed to detect sufficient power. You understand? So higher the power, lesser will be the sample size. Okay, so very important to understand this concept. If the difference is smaller, if you expect the difference to be smaller, then the sample size has to go up. It has to be a higher, bigger sample size. So more is the difference, less is the sample size. Less is the difference, higher is the sample size, okay? So it's very important to understand how you calculate power. So if the number of samples is small, a significant trial may look statistically non-significant. So the number is very important. This is called as a beta error of power. And the power of a trial is always called as one minus beta. So one minus the beta error is called as power of the trial, okay? And the usual power of a trial is kept at 80%. We want 80% power to be able to detect a disease in, in, in your group or to detect a difference, not a disease, a statistical difference in your group. The second factor that I want you to tell me, so first I want you to tell me is power. The second thing that I want you to tell me is significance. Significance is the probability of getting the results if your null hypothesis is true. <clears throat> so if you're looking at a 5% significance, we will have a p-value of 0.05. So it de you decide what is the significance you want to give to your study because more is the significance than bigger is the study. Less is the significance, uh, smaller is the study, okay? And then the effect size. <clears throat> so if group A is effective in 30% of the population and the new drug is effective in 40%, then effect size is B minus A, okay? So 40 minus 30, which is 10%. And if you want to do relative, then it's 30 over 40, okay? I'm not going to go into details, but just know that these are the three factors, three factors. Whenever I ask you, how do you do calculate sample size? You have to say, I want to look at the significance. I want to look at the power of the study. I want to look at expected effect size. I have calculated this three. On the basis of these three, I did a sample size calculation. Normally power is kept at 0.8. Significance is kept at five. And whatever is the effect size that you want, okay? So this is the uh, formula. I want you to know this formula clearly. There is no doubt about it. So sample size and significance. Higher the significance, more is the sample size. Higher the power, more is the sample size that you need. If you want to power your study less, sample size will go down. So it is very important how much of a difference do you want to detect? 
So if you are happy with P less than 0 0.05, then that is acceptable. Okay, that significance is acceptable. Remember this formula, just stay with this. All this that I spoke has no meaning. This is the only thing that matters. Sample size is calculated by significance plus power divided by effect size. If you can tell me this in the exam, I will pass you, okay? All right, thank you very much. Come back and ask me questions. I'm happy to stop if you want, or I'm happy to finish this uh, rest of the talk. Hello. Everybody's gobsmacked. Yes. I'm very sorry. Uh, sir. Hello, sir. I am very sorry. I tried my best. Uh, yes, sir, yes, yes. It's very good lecture. Sir. It, it takes time to digest. <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. R is gone for a toss. My only question ah. to you is are you more confused or less confused? No, 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 no. We are less, less, less confused. Less confused. Yeah. You, you, you. Yeah. Did it did it's it help? Too. Did it help me doing this talk? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, it stimulate go back to the journals and see the statistics and interfer interpret it by own. Rather yeah, than it's, reading the data, it's not easy to give a talk of statistics online. It's yes, it's, difficult, difficult. Yeah, it's not easy to give. It's, a it's talk. very difficult, sir. Because what I need is a blackboard and a white chalk, and I need to be able to draw things and explain to you as I am talking. But uh, the reason why I gave this lecture deliberately is because now it is out there; it will be recorded, and then you please go back and read. Uh, I, I saw a very good, Adnan actually put out a very good technique. He, he put the slides on the top and then he put the book at the bottom. And as the slides were going through, he was reading the book. And I think that's a good way to understand. So now we have done all this hardcore work of statistics. Uh, let us look at uh, how do you interpret clinical trials, okay? If this is the crux of the whole, the whole, you know, Mahabharat was told because you need to understand this. How the hell do you interpret clinical trials, okay? So now stay with me for another 15 minutes or 20 minutes, okay? Are you okay to stay or are you tired? No, no, okay, this is okay. a Please core continue. topic. Very Please important. Continue. Topic. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at that. Whenever you read a paper, whenever you read a paper, what you want to ask yourself is, should I change my practice? Agreed? Simple thing. That's the question you have to ask yourself whenever you read a paper. Problem is, there are too many journals out there, too many easy ways of publishing data. Internet journals, online publications. Most papers that are being submitted are being published, unfortunately. The rejection rate decides the quality of publication. Uh, but a lot of people are paying the journal to publish their paper. So unfortunately, the quality of the research goes down when papers are evaluated. Because if you're gonna pay $400, any journal will accept your paper. You understand that? So it is very important for a clinical practitioner to use a sieve and distinguish between gold versus sand. So when you want to, when you go out there online and try to read papers, it is like a huge lot of bulk of sand and two or three nuggets of gold. And so what you have to do, the whole idea of me teaching you statistics is that I am giving you a sieve and I want you to start shaking the sieve so that the sand goes away and only the gold nuggets stay there so that you actually understand what is the good papers and what is a bad paper, okay? So you should be able to distinguish a good paper from a bad paper and apply that research to your own practice. That is the whole idea. That's why you read a clinical paper. So whenever you read a paper, the first question you have to ask yourself is, are these like my patients? Whatever I'm reading the data, is this what I see every day? So you have to assess your own clinical practice. The subjects in the paper may be sicker or more complicated or your patients might be sicker or more complicated, okay? Your patient's duration of disease may be longer. So always look at the demographics. Start with the demographics of the study. Look at the demographics, most important. 
if the demographics doesn't match your own demographic this study is useless for you throw it away okay because you cannot apply it to your practice so look at this one non intubated thoracoscopic lobectomy for lung cancer okay so you as a thoracic surgeon want to uh, decide should i start doing non intubated thoracoscopic lobectomy in my cases of lung cancer what will make you decide that i will want to change practice besides of course that it is sexy and all that that's different but what will make you decide genuinely on the basis of research so first and foremost is you have to whenever you see a paper always look at this table always all papers have this table and try to analyze this in terms of are these patients similar to my patients you know uh, do i really see this sort of age group look at your uh, there is a uh, lung cancers they have tumor size are my patients of the same type uh, 2.1 cm do i really see 2.1 cm tumors uh, intubated do i see 1 so this is how you decide you look at you you match this data to your data if it is similar then you go ahead and read a little bit more about this paper so the first question is look at the demographics look at uh, post op now do you really see stage 1a cancer if you don't see stage 1a cancer 78.3% of this group was 1a cancer who had non intubated lobectomy now in your clinical practice if you are seeing stage 3 cancers or you know 5 cm cancer then can you actually start adopting non intubated uh, uh, vats for your uh, practice the answer is no so you have to look at this what is the staging at which these guys are operating so very few advanced stages almost all of them are early stages so this is not like your own practice okay so very important to understand that so what happened to the subjects that's the next question you have to ask yourself whenever you are looking at a paper look at what happened to the subjects always review what is called as a consort diagram the consort diagram is a giveaway it's it's surprising how many times people don't look at the consort diagram this is a clear cut giveaway whether the guy has genuinely done good research or not good research a consort stands for consolidated standards of reporting trials it is important to know this word consort okay and i'll show you that in a minute so you have to look at how many people were recruited all the way to what happened at the end of the study so you may start with 1000 but if your study ended with 5 and you presented the paper with 5 patients giving the assumption to the viewers that you are talking about 1000 patients then you are cheating the viewers okay so always follow it look at how many finally made it to the end and that is the key thing how many dropped out that is one important factor and most importantly why did they drop out do you think they dropped out because they got negative results a lot of paper cheat every time they get a negative result they drop the patient from the study so they start with 100 and then if some one patient has a complication they will just take him out of the study so a lot of papers cheat so look for that dropouts are a key clue to to understanding the quality of the paper okay so doctors may delete patients due to lack of response okay because they want they start with one hypothesis they don't start with the nulls hypothesis they start with their own hypothesis that i want to prove that unipotal vats is better than everything else on this world so when you start with a hypothesis you actually have to start that unipotal vats is not good that is a nulls hypothesis but most people when they write a paper they start with unipotal vats is the best thing to happen to mankind and then when you go through the consort diagram you'll find a lot of people have dropped out because somebody had a complication somebody had a uh, you know bleed somebody had a uh, incomplete resection margin those are not reported just the final five who did well get reported so it's very important to look at the consort diagram and i'll show you an example look at this one okay this is how a consort diagram goes enrollment allocation follow up and analysis all of them have to are represented so look at this study they have got contacts n equals study 3 sorry can you see that sorry that uh, thing is coming in my way 
So look at this study. They started with n equals 33, but 12 got dropped out. Okay, 12 got dropped out from there. And eventually they reported on only nine. Okay, and then they will make a statement on the basis of nine, giving you the impression that this is a study which has looked at 33 patients. You understand? So that is very important. The consort diagram gives you a clue whether the guy is lying or not lying, okay? The other thing that you have to look at is, is the study design biased? Let me move this out so you can see it. So in the study design being biased, you have to look at randomization. Is there good randomization for the study? Was there a comparative group? Have they just looked at one group or did they compare A versus B? If you, it's a lot of papers and presenters also do that. They present their series of uniportal VATs and then they make a conclusion that uniportal VAX is very good for the patient. But did you compare uniportal VAX to multiportal VAX to open surgery? And if you've not done that, then your conclusion is wrong. It is not acceptable. So this is very important to understand that did the study have a comparative group or not? That is very, very important. Was there a placebo group? That is again very important. So in our real life, the, the placebo group would be probably multiport or would be open surgery, okay? So it's very important. What about the blinding? You know, was it a single blind, double blind? What are the quality of the blinding of the study? You've got to look at it before you can decide whether a study is good or not good. Did the study include intention to treat analysis? Okay, this is key thing. All randomized patients who are there should have intention to treat. That's the bottom line. All patients who are randomized should have intention to treat. Patients with no intervention received are dropouts. But very often when the paper is presented or written, they take out all the dropouts. Ignore all the dropouts. And all the statistics is done on positive findings, okay? So if these are not included, if dropouts are not included in the intention to treat, then the whole results are skewed. You are massaging the statistics and that's not good. More than 50% papers do this. They do not state the intention to treat. If you have stated the intention to treat, then the analysis should be all patients with intention to treat, whether they dropped out or didn't drop out, or whether there was a positive result or a negative result. So always when you analyze a paper, look for intention to treat. And at the end, look at how many patients did they base their data, or their statistics on. If the final number tallies with intention to treat, then it's a good paper. It has to tally. It has got to include everybody who was included in the trial. You cannot do dropouts. That's the key thing, okay? The other question when you look at a paper is, is this a superior paper? Is this a paper looking at superiority, which means A is better than B? Is it looking at inferiority? A is not better than B. Or is it looking at equivalence? A is equal to B. So, Superiority studies are common. Most of the people who come in and present papers and write papers, they don't start with a nulls hypothesis. They do not. They start with the hypothesis saying A is better than B. And then the whole paper is written on the basis of the hypothesis. A good paper starts with a null hypothesis and then tries to disprove the nulls hypothesis. That is the key thing. So read through the paper and identify, is there a nulls hypothesis? If there is a nulls hypothesis, then that's good. Superiority studies are commonly published. Equivalence or inferiority should be included in the analysis. That is the problem. Most people drop out. Anything that comes A is equal to B, they just drop it. Or A is less than B, they drop it from the analysis. So the 95% confidence interval Maybe less if you include everything in the thing. Uh, sorry, if you exclude things. If you exclude things, then your 95% confidence intervals become narrow because now you've excluded. So you are making a wrong assumption and a wrong thing. And then the sample size changes. 
okay your calculation completely goes haywire if you do not include equivalence or inferiority within the study so that's very important to include all three within the study and to report on all three measurement of parameters have they been defined clearly has the paper defined the measurement standard parameters of measurements have been used the most important thing is is the measurement able to correlate to clinical effect can i change this measurement whatever i'm doing a biomarker does it affect a uh, length of hospital stay so the effect has to be in clinical effect for a paper to be really effective and is it validated against international standards or have they created their own standards so you need a paper which is validated against international standards you need a paper which will tell you that my findings have the following effect on the outcome of your patient then it becomes a good paper okay is the outcome meaningful which means uh, you know if you're using remission rate recurrence rate cure yes it is meaningful you can apply it to your clinical practice the problem is when they don't use meaningful data. biomarker level may not it doesn't mean anything you know what does it matter if the biomarker is 5 or 100 until and unless it helps me detect lung cancer what am i going to do with the biomarker so it's not about biomarker it's the implication on the clinical effect that is very important and surrogate markers are no good if a is equal to b and b is equal to c hence a is equal to c that sort of analysis is no good should never be used in a paper okay multi center trials why do people do multi center trials because we've understood that the sample size is key whenever you want to do anything you want a good sample size so if you are dealing with a rare disease or if you are dealing with a rare surgery then you have to expand the sample size so mesothelioma surgery you hardly one center will hardly do five or 10 in a year so you cannot do a trial on the basis of one center so because you want more data you make it multi center you want to include more patients okay the problem with this is that there is a lack of standardization between various hospitals i may be doing surgery by vad somebody else may be doing it by open the third person a registrar may be doing the surgery so multi center trials have an inherent problem of lack of standardization and protocols have to be very rigid they have to be strictly followed if a multi center trial has to be of good quality so whenever just because somebody's done multi center trial doesn't mean it is good quality you got to read between the lines of the multi center trial to know whether it is worth it or not the other thing is shifting targets okay this is very important concept the techniques improve you know you may report on something and then techniques improve and another thing comes in the problem is the technique may have improved but did it materialize into incremental gain for the patient that is the question you have to ask whenever you see a paper don't get fascinated by new techniques okay new techniques are good but does it mean that it is good for the patient or not so look at this one vats classic example multi port versus two port versus uni port can we say that it's actually making a difference to the patient the technique is getting better but can we say it is making a difference to the patient are clinical outcomes worth it or not worth it that is the key thing okay so these we have got multiple talks of these sort of papers robotic surgery is better than video assisted uh, single port is better than multiple thoracoscopic port okay but when you go into the paper and you read it there are a no clinical effects seen there are no uh, comparison studies they're just making an assumption without comparing a versus b there is very little data so you know the way to do that is then to do a meta analysis so this is the one which we published meta analysis of vats versus uh, robotics versus open within vats we also looked at uniport multiport and robotic so a real detailed analysis of all the factors and then you make a recommendation you have to do the forest plot and you have to make a recommendation whether your technique favors open or favors multiport or favors uniport so this is a paper that you must read I, I recommend you read this paper to understand how statistics can be used to analyze a question okay it's a very very well done paper i have to say i'm pretty happy with this paper and read it to understand how we have used statistics to answer some important questions so when i sit in the audience and i hear somebody talk uh, saying uniportal is better surgery 
I get very upset because there is no data. We have done analysis. We have looked at the data. And at the, till the moment, it may be good for you, it may be good in your hand, but till the moment you can prove to me that it genuinely has a clinical benefit, don't stand up and talk about it. Just say it is possible and it can be done. So there's nothing wrong with the technique. You just have to say it is possible and it can be done. And it is something worth learning. Okay. The other key thing in a study is look at how the missing data is addressed. Very important. Very important. This will give you a clue as to whether the statistics has been formed or not formed. What happened to the dropouts? So there are three ways of dealing with dropouts. Okay. L listen to the three ways. How we deal with dropouts in a study. One way is called as non-responder imputation. Okay. In non-responder imputation, you study everybody. You study all the subjects, whether they are in or out, you study them because they were intention to treat. The problem with that is your success goes down because obviously your figures become less. The second way is you, it's called as a last observation carried forward, which means you study the patient up to a point, one patient up to a point, the other patient all the way through, but you 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 decide what was whatever was the last observation of the patient you carried forward for all the subsequent observations the problem with this is it increases the success rate but leads to errors because you are assuming that this was the finding of the patient in future studies and the third way is called as imputation which means you estimate the results you use a calculation to estimate what would have been the value of this patient if he had continued and that is not good because you cannot estimate results because you you can use all the techniques but it skews the whole result and a lot of studies do this uh, you find n equals uh, 30 at the start you find n equals 30 at the end but out of that 20 had dropped out and those 20 they used an imputation technique in statistics you have an imputation technique where you can estimate the results and until and unless you read carefully into statistical methods, you will not realize that the author has used imputation as a technique. And so he's giving you completely false results. Okay, so you have to be able to distinguish between this. So always look for dropouts. Very, very, very important. Another way to understand that there have been dropouts is to go to the registry, CTRI, okay, clinical trials registry. In this, all trials are registered. When you start a trial, you're supposed to register. And you have to review the website of CTRI. And immediately, you will know how many patients were originally decided in this study. When they got the ethics committee approval, how many patients were decided? And then, when they published the data, how many patients did they publish the data on? Very, very clear cut, you will know. The moment you look at the CTRI side, and it spoke about 100 and uh, 40 patients and then the final paper came out with 32 patients no good no good and you'll find that about 90 percent of papers do this they start with a very the sample size calculation is high but eventually when they report they report only with the very low numbers and so completely the study is wrong and it's not a good paper to use how good are the results is the author hooked on p-value is he all the time trying to prove p-value is he using the moment somebody uses hundreds of tests you must worry about the paper because whenever you have used hundreds of tests it means one test did not give you the answer that you wanted so you use the second test so you use the third test so you use the fourth test people do this they repeatedly put the data back into the thing let's try p-test okay now let's try uh, fisher's exam okay now let's try so methodology of how they have calculated the p-value is very important. The p-value is biased in many, many, many papers. It's they've just used a test which has favored them rather than using the test which is needed for that particular data. So they are trying to prove that Nunn's hypothesis is true. So very, very, very difficult, okay? Look at this, sample size, okay? Now, they gave a study published the paper the first paper was completely published saying that you know there is trending significant trending towards difference they showed this graph and showed that there is a lot of difference between the two though they could not get the p value they actually had the audacity to say 
that you know we are but the moment the same study was done with 500 patients the whole picture changed okay there was no difference between the two treatments hence it's very important to look at uh, at uh, the values of sample size and look at the difference from the sample size how big an effect so always calculate numbers needed to treat i told you about that so in a gi bleed this is just an example of how to do that so absolute risk difference and uh, so numbers needed to treat are quite important to calculate always check the figures look for graphs graphs are classical example look for errors in the graphs very important lot of graphs have error look for axis manipulation sometimes people manipulate the axis to suit their results so if that is done that is not good look for lack of zero on the y point or on the x, x point if your study is not starting from zero there is something wrong with the study people have manipulated the data to give you the answer that they want this was not based on our nulls or hypotheses and most important you look at confidence intervals i have now clearly told you what is statistically significant what is clinically significant so look at you know whether is it touching one is it less than one is it on the same side of unity is it touching 0.85 is it going completely beyond 0.85 so confidence intervals give you a lot of idea whether the paper is good or not good okay so meta analysis a lot of people have this thought process in their mind that meta analysis are the best and every published meta analysis means it is a good paper okay so there is a lot of this thing happening a uh, lot of chinese authors i told you this before they are collecting large data from uh, many 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 uh, uh, databases like the ests uh, dendrite database or the cr database and then throwing questions at it hoping to get an answer and then you know it is called as massaging of the data it's called as fishing so they are fishing in the sea with a small net and hoping to get an answer so a lot of meta analysis published in the chinese journals are completely biased and this beautiful paper talks about it and it says that really all meta analysis have to be carefully looked at more than half of them 85.8% of meta analysis were not properly done 85.8% of meta analysis in published literature were not properly done so very important to understand what is gold and what is sand okay all meta analysis is not gold that is what i'm trying to tell you now this is a classic this this is from uh, alan seo's talk this is a classic paper okay it is the most rubbish paper you can ever come across because it says stereotactic ablative radiotherapy is better than surgery for stage 1 non small cell lung cancer a pooled analysis of two so if you look at the final analysis they say that uh, stereotactic uh, sb sbra is better than lobectomy for stage 1 non small cell lung cancer and it got published in the lancet for god's sake the lancet is not a joke so now we have to look at why did this get published in the lancet and alan has done a classic analysis of this paper and he told us so look at what the points he found he looked at both the rcts he found that there was low recruitment in both rcts and there was early termination in both the rcts the follow up was very short it wasn't long term they just looked at uh, you know few months follow up to say that ct scan is better okay patient is treated he's gone following the sbrt there was no power calculation in the two uh, randomized trials <clears throat> and it was a retrospective pooled analysis so they took one study they took another study put them to together and then did a pooled analysis try to do something like a meta analysis there was no heterogeneity between the rcts okay there was absolutely no the study design the patient selection the protocol the surgical approach and the follow all of them were different between the two groups the demographics was completely different between the two groups there was heterogeneity between the trials because large number of institutions were it was multi center and the protocols in each center was different for treating histological confirmation of the nsc uh, of the lung cancer by biopsy was not required in one of the trials can you imagine you are doing a lung cancer study and you are not even looking for histological confirmation the trial relied on pet 
but SUV was not obtained on all patients. 27 patients were assigned to surgery, but three did not have their assigned surgery. They did not have lobectomy. They had wedge resections. Five out of 27 patients has VAT lobectomies. And we know that VAT lobectomy for a stage 1A lung cancer gives you excellent results. But they used open surgery as a surrogate marker to say surgery is bad for stage 1 lung cancer. And the morbidity and mortality in the surgical group that they put in the paper was very high than expected norm. We have less than 1% mortality in, in VATS uh, lobectomy for lung cancer. These guys were quoting 5 and 6% morbidity and mortality. So why was this published? Well, this got published because of impact factor. Okay, there is a concept called as impact factor. So the more controversial the paper, the more it will be spoken of in other papers. So all surgeons subsequent to this paper started referring to this paper and saying this was rubbish literature, okay? So impact factor is calculated by total citations during the year of the articles in the last two years by total number of citable articles. So the, how, this, is the, this is the numerator and this is the denominator, okay? The first one is numerator, second one. So you want to increase the numerator and you want to decrease the denominator. The way to decrease denominator is to reject a lot of articles. Because case reports never get cited. You know, another paper will never give a reference of a case report. So case reports are straight away rejected nowadays. In all good papers, hardly anybody publish, publishes case reports. So you reduce the number of articles. So increase your rejection rate. But more importantly, bring in papers which will be controversial so that other papers will quote that paper. So whenever from now onwards anybody writes for a uh, paper for surgery for stage 1 in lung cancer, everybody quotes this paper. So automatically the impact factor goes up. So this is the way editors use the technique. So just because this paper is published in the Lancet does not mean that this is a good quality paper. It's very, very, very important to understand that. And you have to realize that when you're reading a paper, what is good and what is rubbish is very important. So I'm going to finish off by this last slide which is evidence-based medicine is gold standard, but you need to know what you're reading is good quality. RCTs are better than case series. Meta-analysis can answer many, many questions, but a lot of meta-analysis are rubbish in the way they have been conducted. International societies and society guidelines do change practice, and please follow <coughs> society guidelines. They are very important, okay? Uh, but remember, they are only guidelines, and if you want to use a different guideline in an individual patient, uh, something different from the guideline, then always back it up with an MDT. Always MDT is very good to support your decision making. Most important is audit your own practice. Please look at your own results. Don't keep doing what you are doing for the last 20 years. That is not acceptable. You have to audit. You have to keep changing your practice. You have to keep putting in new improvement. Very, very important. And anything that you do has to be evidence-based. In the examination, I want people to tell me Whatever statement they are making, what is the evidence behind your statement? I don't care if it is controversial. If you can tell me a paper and a good quality paper, I will accept your answer. I will not question you. This is not a rocket science. This is, you know, it's art. Surgery is an art. It's not a, it's not a science. So we have to uh, give way for individual differences between people. And as long as people can come up with evidence to back their discussion, I am very happy to accept whatever they say. Thank you. Gosh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This was super. Thank you. It was excellent. Oh, my God. This is crazy, man. <laughs> this is excellent. Wow.